Good evening, everybody. Let's get started. Well, let's start with a couple announcements. So there is, uh, there was no homework due this week. There is no quiz due this week. Uh, homework seven will be due next week. So take a look for that on Canvas. Also pre-lab eight is due this week and you will start uh, lab eight. And we'll do a, a little uh, preview of that today. So my office hours will be right after class and the TAs are posted. I have to end my office hours today at 6.30. Uh, so uh, come join after class um, until 6.30. If you have any questions about anything beyond that, uh, about the technical work, the TAs have two sets of office hours on Thursday. So you could join uh, them at their office hours, or you can post your questions to Slack. And as always, unmute if you have any questions or shoot a chat. And otherwise, please stay muted so we can keep the background noise low. So let's get started with uh, with a preview of Lab 8. I think Lab 8 is pretty fun. It's it's demonstrating um, a transistor circuit and also a practical function of a of a transistor. You've probably used a headlamp with a dimming function, so you're going to build a circuit that that does that. Um, so you're going to design, build, and test a transistor driver circuit. So a driver circuit is usually considered a circuit that takes an input, a very low power input, and produces uh, an output that could control something that requires higher power. And that's what you're going to do. You're going to use a transistor to do this. Uh, as the load, you're going to build an LED circuit, right? And the driver circuit is going to control uh, that load, the LED circuit. Um, and then you're going to demonstrate controlling brightness of an LED using pulse width modulation. So your circuit's going to look like this. Uh, it's, it's going to be a transistor that you put into saturation. You're going to design for some RB value uh, such that the transistor goes into saturation when you apply five volts at the uh, input. And then you'll have this uh, control device, this load uh, that, that the transistor is controlling. So that control device in this case is going to be an LED circuit, just a resistor in series with an LED. And you'll set the amount of current that, that goes through that LED uh, based on the resistor R1 value. So your whole circuit will look like this all together, the control device. With, with the transistor connected together. Uh, you'll be measuring values, the voltage across the resistors and VCE and IB. Um, you will be using the 2N3904 transistor. It looks like this. This is the package you should see in your kit. During the pre-lab, you're going to design the, the load circuit, right? the LED circuit and the transistor driver. And during the lab, you're going to first build the load circuit to get that working, light up the LED, and then you're going to build the transistor driver circuit to control the load, and, uh, and then you'll follow that with a pulse width modulation experiment I'll talk about next. But note the pinout of the transistor. So note that one side of this package has, has a flat side, right? You can see two different views of it here, um, and you can see which pins of which of these three pins is the emitter, which is the base, which is the collector. So, so be sure to pay attention uh, to which pin is emitter, base, or collector. You have the same designation over here on the left. You have pins one, two, and three, and you can see which, which terminals those correspond to on the transistor schematic diagram over here. You're going to be using data out of the transistor data sheet. And so this is just a snippet out of that. It's one of the tables. And um, you can find this data sheet on the course website if you want to look at the whole data sheet. Uh, the pre-lab describes what values to read from this data sheet. So it's gonna walk you through uh, which values to use. You can see there's lots of values here. Um, and it's gonna help you choose conservative values for your design. For example, you don't want to choose a beta that's, that's too small 
uh, I'm sorry, uh, that's too large because you might uh, under design your base current. So it's going to help you through that. Um, you're actually going to use a really conservative value here. Um, uh, HFE is actually the beta value. Re take a look at the pre-lab. It talks about that. And you're going to use a value of, of uh, around 30. So you can also see there's collector emitter saturation voltage, VCE saturation. All right, typically for kind of lower currents, here's that familiar 0.2 volts. For higher currents, the VCE goes up to maximum uh, 0.3 volts. You're gonna see a lot lower uh, VCE values in lab. It's probably gonna be 0.1 volts or less, but you're gonna design using, again, these higher values to be conservative in your design. And again, take a look at the data sheet on the course website um, for, for more information. So you're, you're then going to um, test a pulse width modulated dimmer. So it's essentially your circuit. This will be your circuit with your LED. And you're going to use a waveform generator instead of, uh, instead of a DC power supply to produce a square wave um, as the input control voltage. And you're gonna start with a one hertz square wave just to get the LED to blink, right? Just to test your connections. And then you'll increase the frequency to one kilohertz and vary the duty cycle. And you'll see that you can dim this LED down to, well, nothing, or full bright down to nothing by changing the, the duty cycle. And, uh, and, and then you're gonna do this experiment. So you're going to test the response of your eyes. So you, basically that means you're gonna blink this LED at, at, uh, at the highest frequency at which, at which you can distinguish the flashing. And you know, I'm curious to see the responses. I think I, think I know what everybody's uh, eye response is going to be, you know, where the light uh, looks like it's blinking and where at a little higher frequency, it looks like it's a, just a, a dim solid light. So. They'll play with that circuit a bit. Um, when you power your circuit, let me go back up to, to this diagram here. When you power your circuit, you're going to use, um, <clears throat> for this part of the lab, when, when you just test your, test your circuit, um, five volts will be the positive supply out of the AD2. And you're also going to use that same power supply, right, the, the five volt node voltage, to connect to V in when you want V in. Uh, at five volts. So you could, you know, connect the same power supply to two points when it's set to five volts to control these two voltages. When you want V in to be zero, you disconnect the power supply from, from the V in node, and then you just connect that node to ground. And that's how you make zero volts happen at V in. So all that's explained in the pre-lab. Take a look at the pre-lab. Uh, be sure to read that. Um, if you have any questions, uh, ask us during office hours or, uh, post your questions on Slack. Okay, so next, what I'd like to do is move on to some material. We're going to finish up comparators today. Okay. So we left off last time uh, talking about the inverting comparator with hysteresis. So this is that circuit that I kind of messed up here. This is the, the inverting comparator with hysteresis. And um, it has, It has a resistor R3 that causes the threshold voltage VA to change based on the state of the output. And so that's what we did yesterday, uh, yesterday last class. We, we derived uh, what is VA if V out is five volts, right? And if V out is zero volts, what is VA? And so we determined that the threshold actually changed uh, based on the state of the output voltage. And, and that's what you want. You want these two different thresholds so that th the switching action happens at, at different input voltages. Okay, so I, I mentioned this is a great way to calculate what VA is, and it's a little cumbersome in order to do a design. Um, the design would consist of something like this. 
design an inverting comparator with hysteresis that has a uh, threshold VA1 of 3 volts and VA2 of 2.5 volts. Okay. So you would really just draw this circuit. It, the, the problem or the design problem would include what to use for VCC and VEE. And, and then you have to choose these four resistors. Well, R4 I talked about, generally a 1K ohm resistor is good to use there because you want that resistance uh, small enough so that the other resistances in the circuit are large compared to R4. Um, and you want uh, R4, well, big enough so you don't have a lot of current flowing from the power supply into your op amp and kill your battery if the battery operated device. So, so 1K is a good, good choice here. So, um, See, let me bring this up. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, um, so let's talk about the design process for an inverting comparator with hysteresis. So I want to break this down into steps. Um, so let me write down design process. And again, you could go use these equations and you have two equations and actually three unknowns. You'd have to make a choice uh, of one of those resistor values and then solve these equations. There's a little, there's a little easier way to do that um, by parameterizing the uh, hysteresis band and then defining this other per intermediate parameter. I'll show you what I mean. Let's break this down into steps. First, you're going to choose VA1 and VA2, or you're going to be given VA1 and, and VA2. Okay, it's either stated or it's your design, you have to choose. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is calculate a delta VA, which is the hysteresis band. It's the difference between those two thresholds. So that's VA1 minus VA2. It'll give you a, a positive value. Then you're going to calculate this intermediate parameter. It's just a parameter that helps you solve these equations a little more easily. It's going to be delta VA over VA2. So you calculate that value. Um, and, and then you're going to choose an R3 value. Actually, you're gonna choose an R3 and an R4 value. And I'm going to say you're going to choose a large R3. Um, and you want R3 large so that V out isn't a voltage um, that's created by a voltage divider between R4, R3, and R2. Okay. So uh, you just want, really, you want R3 big compared to R4. So I use this example. I think uh, when I talked about um, the load for a comparator, 100 K ohms is a pretty big value. Uh, so you choose R3 large, 100 K ohms, and choose um, R4. Your pull-up resistor to be 1 K ohm. You know, you might if if you have different um, battery life requirements, you might change these values, but these are good baseline values to use. Okay, so now that you have chosen two of your four resistor values, you could go back and essentially use these equations to find the other two values. Well, an easy way to do this is R1 is equal to N times R3, right? Where you've chosen R3, here's your N value. And then step five, R2, is equal to R1 in parallel with R3 over VCC over VA1 minus one. Okay, so you have basically two equations here once you've chosen R1 and R, uh, oh, sorry, R, R3 and R4, okay? 
so that's the design process. So now you could actually build a thermostat if you knew what voltage, uh, let's say, corresponded to uh, 70 degrees F. We'll get to sensors later in the course, but if you knew that 70 degrees F was some voltage and then 68 degrees F corresponded to another voltage out of your temperature sensor, uh, then, then, then you could build a thermostat that, uh, that varied uh, uh, turning the heater on and off to hold the temperature between those two, those two values. That's okay. Awesome. Yes. So I understand where like the um, logic behind making R3 really large and R4 really small in comparison comes from. Um, where did the formulas for R1 and R2 come from? Uh, they, they come from these two equations on the left. Okay. So these, these are the solutions. Uh, it's, it's an alternate way of solving these two equations. I should say it's just kind of an easy way of solving these two equations on the left. So what you could do is if you given a VA1 and a VA2, and given uh, R3 and R1, in both of these, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, given R, R, R3 and R4 in both uh, R3 here, you could go solve for R1 and R2. This is just a shortcut way to do that. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions on, on comparators? Okay, well, we've hit another milestone in the course. Uh, let me share a screen here. So we have worked through all of the circuits um, and now all of the electronics topics. We just finished up operational amplifiers. So remember that there are two types of circuits uh, that you could build in this class with operational amplifiers, either a, a linear circuit like an amplifier or a comparator. So we we talked about that, and now we're going to move on to uh, digital logic and systems. And actually, the comparator topic is a pretty good segue into digital systems because if if you look at the output of an inverting comparator or an inverting comparator with hysteresis, you get a high or low value, right? The output is either high or the output is low. That's like a true false value in a comparison or a one zero value, you could think in, in kind of the digital domain. So we're going to uh, move into digital topics now. Okay, so, um, we're going to talk about uh, the fundamentals of digital circuits. We're going to talk about uh, um, what it means to be a digital signal, uh, what, what, how that is represented, how the signal is represented by different voltage values. And we're gonna talk about, uh, after that, logic circuits, which let you make a decision uh, with circuits based on inputs, based on digital inputs. So I'm going to use the term signal. And when I say sig signal, I mean it's a, a voltage or a current actually that represents information uh, with their values. So in other words, um, uh, the different voltage levels could be mapped to different pieces of information or different meanings of information. Okay, so we'll talk more about that. An analog signal takes on a value in a continuous range. So by that, I mean you could have three volts, four volts, 2.68 volts, pi volts. It's, it's a continuous range um, where information is represented. Think about a signal coming from a microphone going into an amplifier. There's a, there's a range of voltages and any voltage contains a valid information point, right? It's, it's the, waveform that represents maybe your voice. Digital signals, however, are restricted to a, a few ranges of values. Um, let's talk about what that means. So 
I'd like to talk about binary signals because, well, binary signals are restricted to two ranges of values. And they represent values of, well, zero or one, off or on, no or yes, false or true. You could assign whatever meaning you want to those two ranges of, let's say, voltages. Um, and we'll talk more about how that works. But binary signals can represent two states or, or uh, two, um, two different meanings of a variable, like off or on, yes or no. Okay. There are digital signals that are multi-level. So you could have maybe four levels, four different values represented. We're not going to dig into those. We're going to stick with binary signals. They are a lot more common, uh, for example, in microprocessors, microcontrollers, computer processing. So we're going to stick with binary signals. OK, so let's move away from analog inputs to digital inputs. Let's, let's talk about the benefits of, of digital signaling. And now, there are some disadvantages. Digital signal, signaling is a little more complex, but it does give you some performance advantages uh, to, depending upon your application. But let's start out by defining, just drawing an example analog signal. So I'm going to say analog here. And it's just some voltage versus time. And remember, the an, an analog signal, like a voice signal, can take, a, take on any, uh, any value in a continuous range. What I mean is that any one of these values along this function represents a valid piece of information. It's interpreted as a, as a voltage. So, in an analog system, actually in any system, noise is introduced. I, I think I mentioned the last, last class that uh, electrons have random movements um, and that causes noise in circuits and it's always present. There's also, there's also interference, right? So you could have interference from power systems and oscillators and different computer systems that, that use clocks and also introduce uh, artificial noise. But if I look at this noise introduction as a sum with an input and an output, and just kind of sketch out what this would conceptually look like, so I would have some kind of random value that sort of followed the original signal, right? But it has noise on top, top of it. It's a, the signal's corrupted. The original information uh, is not exactly represented uh, in the output of a, of a circuit because there's noise added to it, okay? Uh, the point is, a point is that for analog signals, it is not possible to extract the exact information uh, that you put into a circuit. Okay, if you put in this signal into a circuit, there's going to be noise added. You're going to get some distortion, some corrupted value at the output. And you may not care about the level of noise. Uh, if it's a, an audio signal, it's, it's a, let's say a, a headset, you plug it into an output, uh, analog output jack, you're listening to your music. If you can't hear the noise, you don't care, but it's there. So if you do care, if you can hear the noise, uh, then, then it's a problem. Let's contrast that with a digital signal. Let's say it's a voltage. 
so a digital signal, I'm going to make it kind of simplified here. We'll talk about exactly what what this th threshold means in a, in a minute, but just to kind of simplify things. It, let's suppose I want to send a sequence of ones and zeros, and I'm going to define one to be above this red line and zero to be below this red line. So let's, let's suppose I'm sending a voltage like this down a wire. So what I'm doing is I'm actually encoding values. Let's say one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. I'm encoding values with, uh, with this voltage. So any voltage at regularly sampled intervals, right? Any voltage above that red line is, is a one, any voltage below is, is a zero. That's how I'm defining this digital system to operate. Now, this is a voltage. If this voltage goes into a circuit, goes down a wire, uh, there is going to be noise introduced. It's going to be summed in there. And so at the output, you would have something that, well, looks like this. Okay, these are both voltages here. And so let's suppose I, I'm trying to decode whether at regularly sampled intervals, right? So regularly sampled intervals, uh, if the signal is representing a one or a zero. Well, I, I think you could see that, well, you can. At this sample point, I get a one. At this one, I get a zero, right? So the point is that even though the output signal has uh, noise, it is possible to extract the exact information error-free um, th that I put into the circuit. So that is a benefit of digital circuits. It's possible to extract the same information that you put into the circuit. Okay, without any errors. Now, there's always a probability of error. There's always a probability that there's going to be a big noise spike when I'm making a decision, or, or if I, you know, if I come over here and I say there could be a, like, if the noise is huge, then maybe I can't tell if the voltage at a certain sample point is above or below a threshold. Well, yeah, there can be errors, but the point is, in a digital system, it is possible to extract the exact information. In an analog system, you will always have some kind of corruption due to noise. You may or may not care about that level uh, of, of noise, but it's always there. Okay. So let's, let's, uh, let's talk about this threshold. This is, um, this is kind of a simple way to describe what I showed here, but in reality, Remember, I talked about digital signaling involves two ranges of voltages, not just, um, not just one threshold value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this vertical axis for a digital signal, and I'm going to draw it again. And I'm going to put some voltages uh, on that vertical axis. Um, so, Professor? Yes. That last thing you're saying about how we can determine the uncorrupted signal. Is that specifically for binary, not just digital signals in general? That's right. Digi digital signals in general, you could do that. If you had, let's say, four level signaling where you have multiple ranges, you still could extract. It's possible to extract uh, the exact um, information that was encoded on that signal. OK, OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me draw that, just the vertical axis again. So that's some voltage value. If you're working in what's called five volt logic, there's five volt logic, there's three volt logic, there's 3.3 volt logic. I'm just gonna mention a couple here. Um, let's start at 
zero at the bottom here and go up to five volts here. Um, what five volt logic means is that nominally five volts is a logic level one. It means binary one or true, however you want to represent it. Zero uh, is a binary zero. We're going to talk about binary numbers, but zero represents a binary zero. Um, but actually there's a range of values in here. And it depends on the, the logic family you're working with and the exact chips you're working with. You'd actually have to go look at the data sheet. But I want to define a couple ranges just to show you why I said two ranges and not two values. Between 2.4 volts and 5 volts for this particular chip that I looked up, um, that range represents a logic level one. Okay, between zero volts and 0 0.4 volts, that range represents a logic level zero. So if you take a voltmeter and you measure 4.2 volts, you would be measuring a logic level one. If you measure 0 0.1 volts, you'd be measuring a logic level zero, or you would interpret it as a logic level zero. In the middle here, right, this is transition only. So, which means as a voltage transitions from a zero to a one, well, it has to cross through this transition only region. But if you measured a voltage like two volts, uh, you would not be able to interpret that as a one or a zero. It must be a transition between logic, logic levels. Uh, there's a, again, there's different families of logic, different voltages of logic. There's 3.3 .3 volt logic. Let's just call it, let's just use three volt logic. It says 3.3, 2.2, 0 0.4. So in, in this three volt logic or 3.3 .3 volt logic, sometimes they're used interchangeably. This would be a logic level one, logic level zero and transition only. Okay, so you'd be told, or the data sheet for the chip would, would say what these values uh, are, what these voltage ranges are to represent a one and a zero for a digital chip. Okay, let's talk about these ones and zeros. So, these ones and zeros in a binary number system are generally called a bit, which actually stands for something. All right, so it's binary digit. That's what a bit is. A word uh, is a group of multiple bits. Okay, so you could have a three-bit word, has three bits, kind of like you can have a you know three-letter word with in English. You could have a three-bit word uh, in in uh, binary. Um, you can have a seven-bit word. You can have a thirty-two-bit word. Uh, there's a there are a couple special words. A byte is a special word. It's an eight-bit word. And actually, there's something called a nibble. And that's a four bit word. So if you have so many megabytes of storage, you have uh, you know, so many million eight bit words of storage. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, why are eight and four so important? Are those because of the two to the power of? Yeah, gen or? 
it, it is that that two to the n you're going to see two to the n where n is an integer show up a lot and um and I, i've heard different stories about why a byte was so important um you know back when computers were first microprocessors were first being developed um you know that there there was a uh an encoding system called ASCII, which was ASCII. -A it was like the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. It defined uh, eight bits, which represents 256 values, and you could represent a bunch of different characters. So you could have uppercase letters and lowercase letters and different symbols. And so eight bits, an eight-bit word was important for representing those values. Um, a four-bit word is important, and you're going to see when we get to hexadecimal, uh, four bit words are nicely represented with hexadecimal digits. And, and so we'll get there in a, uh, either end of this class or next class. Awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions about words or, or this, these logic values? Uh, so again, are we, specifically dealing with binary in this case with the zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this case, these are binary logic levels. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So just just to give you an example, you you could have a circuit that had let's say four levels. You know, zero to zero point two, zero point seven to one point two. I'm just making these up right. Two point oh to uh two point nine. Yeah, three point one to four point zero. You you could define four levels. Uh, it's not it's not commonly done. It's more common to use binary signaling because uh, 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 you can represent you can store memory and you could do switching between two levels easier more easily than you can with four levels. You can build a circuit that does this. It's just a lot more common to use uh, binary signaling. Okay. Like, in that case where you had like four levels, how would you uh, represent them? Like how here when we have two, we have zero and one. How would you represent it here? Yeah. Well, so, you know, zero and one, there's nothing special about calling this zero and calling this one. This could be called um, no, and this could be called yes, or this could be called A, and this could be could called B, right? You don't, it's just representing two different uh, symbols in in uh in the possible values you could represent you could even call this a b c d or you know one two three four something like that um you can make it represent whatever information you wanted okay and so, um, and another question what's the two to the end there oh two to the end well so we'll get more into this but uh you're going to see that we're going to work in in base two values. So two to an integer is going to show up a lot. Two to the one, two to the squared, two cubed. Uh, those values are going to show up. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's let's dig into binary uh, number systems, or bi the binary number system, I should say. Okay, so let's uh, let's start out by talking about decimal, the decimal number system. So we all know decimal. We have all have a very good feel for how decimal works. So I like relating this conversation to decimal. When you say decimal, what you're implying is a base ten number system. Okay, what's base ten mean? Base ten well, one meaning is that you have 10 symbols to represent a digit in a base 10 number. Okay, so zero through nine, that's, there are 10 symbols, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those are 10 different symbols you can use uh, to represent values for each digit in a decimal number. Uh, let, let's do this, let's, let's take a decimal number and pick it apart and then we'll do the same thing for a binary number, right? Number 743.2. 
so I, I made this, uh, I put this decimal point here because I want to define it. We're going to call that a radix. A radix is, a, is the, the dot that separates the integer part of a number from the fractional part of a number. Okay, so we look at this number, we kind of, we know what it means, but let's explicitly write out what this value means. So when we look at this number, we're actually interpreting these symbols relative to the radix. And what I mean by that is, well, okay, what's that seven mean? That seven is a value, we understand that value. And its position relative to the radix tells us this, that it's seven, this value seven in that position represents seven times the base to the power of its position, where the first digit's position zero, the second digit is position one, this third digit, the seven, is position two. So that represents 700, okay? If we go to the next digit, the four, the four represents its value times the base to the power of its position, position zero, one, okay? The three, right? So one to the one position left of the radix, so that's three times the base to the power of zero, that's position zero. The two, right, uh, is in position, well, I'm gonna call that uh, negative one, it's in the negative one position, so that's two times the base 10 to the power of negative one. So that's how we uh, represent a number, and that's what that number means. If you don't usually break it out like that in our head, but since we work with decimal all the time, we know how to interpret that number. But I think it's good to start there because now let's talk about binary values. Binary values uh, are base two, meaning there are two symbols that you're going to use for each digit, a zero or a one. But we can do the same thing. We can break a binary number apart. Let's say one, one, zero, one point one. Let's, let's say I tell you that's a binary number. Let's figure out how to interpret that. Okay, so I would interpret that number as, well, let's start on the left here. This one, it's in position zero, one, two, three. So it's one times the base to the power of three. Okay. We have another one right here. So that's position zero, one, two. Then we have a zero, so it's zero times, again, the base to the power of its position, zero, one, right? Plus one times the power, times the base to the power of its position. We have the radix with a one right after the radix. Okay, so that's how you would interpret that binary number. So this is where that kind of two to the integer value shows up all the time. Uh, you'll get used to what two to the n is for any value of n, probably less than about 12, n less than 12. But um, so this is an eight, right? This is a four, this is a zero, this is a one, this is a one half. So this value, 1101.1, one, 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 you could interpret as 13.5 in decimal. Now, um, it's easy to see, well, it's easy to see that this number, 13.5, is not binary because I have a 3 and a 5. It's not so easy to say that 1101.1 one, one, one one is a binary number, that, that could be a decimal number. So what we do is we actually write a subscript after a number to denote uh, its base. 
So this is 1101.1 1, 1, base 2. That means that uh, it's a binary number. This is 13.5 base 10. That means it's a decimal number. OK, any questions on this? Let's talk about going the other way. Let's talk about going from decimal to binary. L let's take a number like 23, base 10. We want to convert that number to binary. Now remember, you're trying to make up uh, this value, 23, out of values that are 2 to the n, right? 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 squared, 2 to the third. You're trying to figure out what values of 2 to the n have to add up to be 23 so that you can fill in 1s and zeros into these digits here. The way I like to do this is I like to start out, well, what's the biggest value of 2 to the n? Right? I'm write 2 to the n over here. Uh, what's the biggest value of 2 to the n that fits in 23? Well, I would claim 16. 16. Uh, it's two, well, let's just write 16 here, is uh, 2 to the four, fourth, right? 2 to the fifth would be 32. Uh, that would be too big to fit in 23. So we're going to write this value down because we're going to populate one of these bits in the word uh, with a 1 that corresponds to the, the, the value of 16. And, and then you have to account for the remainder. I'm going to write REM. The remainder value. So once I've filled up, uh, once I've taken 16 off of 23, I wind up with, well, seven more values, seven more that I have to account for. So you ask yourself, well, what value 2 to the n fits in uh, 7? Well, that's 4, which is 2 squared. Right, so now 16 plus 4 uh, is, is 20. I have a remainder of 3 I have to account for. You ask yourself, what value 2 to the n? Well, 2. Right? And now I have 16 plus 4 plus 2, 22. I have to account for one more. So that's a 1 equals 2 to the 0. So now, now that I know what powers of 2 uh, I add together to get I add together to get 23, um, I can write those into, I can create a binary number. So this position, right, let's say the radix is here, it's an integer. So this is 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 squared, 2 to the 3rd, 2 to the 4th, 2 to the 5th. Okay, so let's see, I have a 2 to the 0 here, put a 1 there. I have a 2 to the 1, put a 1 there. I have a 2 squared. I don't have a 2 to the third. I have a 2 to the fourth. OK, so I could say 23, oops, that's not right, 23 base 10 equals 10111 one, 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 one base 2. OK? You'll get some practice doing that on, on your homework after next week's homework. So, Don't worry about uh, leading zeros and trailing zeros. We'll work with that a little more. But for example, I could put a zero here. I could put a zero here, another zero here, two to the six. I could put point zero zero. It doesn't matter. Um, leading zeros and trailing zeros don't change the value. It's like I can say I have a number. 2.25 in, in decimal. I can add a zero here. I can add another zero, right? I can even add, that's kind of weird to add leading zeros, but you could, and it doesn't change the value. So don't worry about leading and trailing zeros in binary, just like you don't worry about them in, in decimal. Okay. All right. Well, uh, it's 610. So we're going to end class here. Um, Remember that uh, pre-lab 8 is due this week, and you'll start lab 8 on, uh, on Friday. And my office hours today will be right after class. 
and I will be able to go to 6.30 today. So thanks for joining class. I hope it's working out well. Let me know if anything isn't working out well, and I will start office hours in just a minute. Thanks for joining.